to introduce Mrs. Bell. But I want Chris Ivey, who is a member of the uh, Black History um, Women's Month Committee. Please come now and uh, share with us about the remainder of this month. Chris Ivey, give her a warm clap. <laughs> Maggie C. Walker, Coretta Scott King, Evelyn Easton, Lily B. Rowley, Nancy Baldwin, just to name a few. A few, we salute all of our Calvary sisters this morning, all of our Calvary sisters, and we continue to do so throughout the month. And just to name a few of Calvary sisters, Christine Ivey, Pauline, Paulette Waite, Destiny Muckles, Jeanette Lye, Dorothy Tyson, Billy Robinson, Mildred Tramble, Willa Mae Copeland, Joan Crawford, Lucille Wright, Mildred Snell, Valerie Day, Eunice Hansford, Iris Tuckman, Mira Malone, Lois Hug Hogans, Deaconess Emma Urquhart, Deaconess Bernice Slade, Linda Smith, Lynn Lisa Liu, Alice Crawford, Deaconess Crawford, Lisa Weaver, Catherine Sellers, Deaconess Catherine Sellers, Laverne Savage, Ruth Franklin, Annabelle Whittacle, Linda Smith, Selena Brown. And may we pay special tribute to our fine sister in the struggle who have much and have given so much to young leaders in our motherland to ensure that they receive a quality education so that they will be afforded an opportunity to have a quality lifestyle. We will continue to pray for our fine sister, Sister Ofer Wentz. And we continue, our sister who has certainly tread the waters and continue to do so. And in her own right, she's a poet, she's a playwright, an educator, a woman of God, who devotes her time to teaching, educating, giving, caring, and praying for the children of this city. And her goal is to ensure that all our children have an opportunity for a successful life. And I'm speaking of none other but our First Lady, 
of Calvary Baptist Church. Now let us stand and greet the First Lady Deaconess, Dorothy Collins Rowe. next to the furnace room. And he did. So, so the Satan went on about doing his duties as he always, you know, up and down the earth. And the next thing you knew, this engineer had air conditioned the furnace room, had put fans, electric fans in the ceilings of all the rooms, had built an escalator from level one to level two, all the way down to level five. Then, in a few uh, days, the phone rang, and it was St. Peter. He said, I want to know how is that engineer doing down there. He said, he's doing just fine. He's air-conditioned the furnace room. He's put fans in all the cells. He's built an escalator. Now he's putting in revolving doors. So St. Peter says, we made a mistake. Send him up here. He said, oh no, I won't let this one go. Then St. Peter says, well, I'm going to talk to God about this because we might have to sue you. He says, I don't know why, because i got all the lawyers down here. <laughs> well, last week, the Presbyterian Church had a celebration, and the minister's wives were asked, asked to speak on the theme if you really knew me. And I don't know if there's anybody here that doesn't know me because it's not a whole lot to know. <laughs> but when I thought about it, I remembered hearing the phrase or the title of a book or the title of a movie or something some years ago, the me nobody knows. So I guess what the statement was saying is, who are you really? If you really knew me. Well, some people know me uh, as a church worker or a teacher, but you can't always judge a book by its cover. I know appearances do not always spell reality, for there are several means. There is the me in terms of what I eat, and I do eat. I like to cook, and more importantly, I like to eat. Much of what I know about gourmet cooking, I learned from Miss Savannah Montague. I like cornbread, especially the crusty edges. I like vegetables from asparagus to zucchini, yellow and green, and that's anything that's put on the table. I like fruit 
apples, oranges, melons, and pears. I like chicken, but fish is my main dish. I like lamb, turkey, ham, and yams. I like food, cooking it and eating it. I asked myself the question, what on earth am I here for? Is it not just to eat? The scripture says, for we are God's handiwork. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. If you really knew me, you would know that I believe nothing is too hard for God, thus nothing is too hard for a child of God. If you really knew me, you would know that I believe I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you really knew me, you would know that I believe that I must work while it's day. You know, you would know that I believe work before me is loving people, helping people, caring and sharing and serving people. I believe God's directive to love thy neighbor is not a wish, it's a command. I believe God called me to share him and his son with others. Yes, sometimes it's a lot of work, and sometimes I get tired like you get tired. But like my aunt said, used to say, I get tired in the work, but not tired of the work. I believe that they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. I believe that it is my responsibility to be a positive example for others, not only a visible example, but a working and serving example. My mother always said that anything worth doing is worth doing well. Anything worth having requires work, hard work, whether it is getting a good education, having a successful career, supporting a loving family, or cultivating positive personal relations. What good is it for you to be on the right track if you're just going to sit there? We are called to be active. If we really knew, if you really knew me, you would know that I will not ask anyone to do something that I wouldn't do myself. Anything worth doing requires my best effort. I remember way back in elementary school, Dr. Hodges, Mr. Kerr, Mr. Say, when I was in elementary school, I was a safety patrol. I was a fine safety patrol. I put on my belt, and they were orange in those days, I think they're green now. And I was so happy to stand at the end of the hall at the top of the staircase directing children. Remember then you had to walk to the right in the hallways. And then when I graduated from hall duty, they put me at the gate of the playground. I was somebody. I did my best. I remember when I got in middle school, I was a cafeteria monitor. That meant I had to sell the ice cream sandwiches. I sold ice cream sandwiches like you would never, never believe. I love selling ice cream sandwiches. When I went to high school, I was elected in my senior year as president of the student government. I would go to Washington and represent the school at the uh, uh, citizenship ceremonies. I was on the school newspaper. I played basketball. Yes, I won the Betty Crocker Homemakers of America contest, believe it or not. If you don't believe it, I, have, I still have my pen. And if you saw me in the meeting last week, I had it on, because I wear it occasionally. It says, Betty Crocker. <laughs> the thing that I didn't like, some of the old boys just called me, Miss Betty Crocker, Miss Betty Crocker, Miss Betty Crocker. <laughs> I was in a drama club, and the highlight of one of my experiences was going to the University of Delaware, where I played in A Midsummer Night's Dream. All right. I remember giving the valedictorian speech at my high school graduation. 
I remember at Howard University having a double major and a double minor. All right. I remember working my fingers to the bone even after midnight. I remember caring no less than 19 hours, sometimes as much as 21 hours. But you knew I, had to, I knew I had to get out in four years. <laughs> I remember serving as a mentor to freshman girls in my junior and senior years. I remember majoring in history. I remember taking archery and golf and swimming. If you really knew me, you would know that I believe the best classroom is not within four walls. The best classroom is life itself. The best measure of success is not in things. Success is based upon how you meet life's challenges, the good and the not so good. If you really knew me, you would know that I say get involved in life. Be active and interactive. Travel. Travel all over this state. Travel all over this country. Travel all over this world. Make the world your classroom. If you really, really knew me, you would know that I am somewhat involved in my church and that my church is Calvary Baptist Church. As a pastor's wife, much like you, I get involved. I don't have to be, but I choose to be. I teach Sunday school, and there are my students. I teach vacation Bible school and Saturday school. I attend classes and workshops and seminars and conferences. I am a missionary. I pray every day, sometimes all day. I worship and I praise God daily. I strive to make every experience a learning experience. I am determined not to be defeated by so-called defeats. I remember that it takes sunshine and rain to make a rainbow. I learned to laugh, and I love to laugh, Miss Ivy. Humor is excellent medicine for what ails me. It's that spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine go down. You should learn to laugh, smile, tell a joke. I remember one time, this being Women's History Month, a, a woman was watching the news. And on the news, there came uh, an interruption. It says, uh, alert. They want everybody to be aware that there was a man on the highway, a, a car on the highway, going in the opposite direction, causing a lot of accidents. So she, being a caring wife, tried to call her husband on a cell phone. Now, he didn't know quite how to use it, but she called him on his cell phone thinking that she could be of some assistance to keep him from having an accident himself. So she, he finally answered the phone, and she said, Honey, I want you to be careful. There's a man on the highway driving in the wrong direction. He looked out the window. He said, no, no, don't worry. There's a whole bunch of them out here driving in the wrong direction. <laughs> I say to you, get a hobby. Find enjoyment in doing something that is totally different from what you do every day. I don't mean sleep. I don't mean go to the ball. I don't mean watch TV. I personally like gardening and arts and crafts, working with children and writing and producing plays and ballroom dancing and listen to jazz and go into the theater, especially the Broadway. If you really knew me, you would know that God is first and foremost in my life. You would know that my husband pastor is my role model. His support, his wisdom, his generosity, super generosity, knowledge, energy, service, and loving kindness caring and sharing spirit have helped mold me and shaped me to be who I am today. You would know that I have a great, big, loving family. My biological family as well as my church family. If you really, really knew me, you would know that I am the great granddaughter of Harry Tubman, whose legacy was freedom for my people. 
if you really, really, really knew me, you would know that I am the great grand niece of Soldier of the Truth. Truth who fought for the rights of her people. Her question to the nation, Mr. Say, was, what ails this Constitution? It's got holes in it. When it comes to us colored folk, it seems that a weasel has eaten up all our rights. If you really, really, really knew me, you would know that I am the granddaughter of Mary McLeod Bethune, who was so determined to help educate black children that she, with only a dollar and 50 cents in her pocket, bought some lumber, built a school that is now known as the thriving uh, Bethune Cookman College in Daytona Beach, Florida. If you really, 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 really knew me, you would know that I am the daughter of Dorothy Irene Height, who worked with the poor and needy as a social worker. She found her calling in empowering women, calling them to take leadership roles in life. If you really, really, really knew me, you would know that I, like my sister Maya Angelou, life has not always dealt me an even hand, but still I rise. If you really, 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 really knew me, you would know my sister Oprah was my greatest thrill, my greatest fulfillment in helping other people, schooling. If you really, really, really knew me, you would know that I am the daughter of John Calvin and Elvin Ward Collins, sister of Vera Murray, an assistant superintendent, sister of Anne Clyde, a fashion designer, sister of John Charles, a chemist, sister of Elliot Floyd, former college professor, former college president and now professor, sister of Trella Collins, a middle school administrator and teacher of French, and David Collins, a, an engineer and wife of Albert Red Suit. <laughs> if you really, really knew me, you would know that I am no different than any one of you. I believe God put me in this package and he put me in, and he put you in your package for a purpose. His directive to love your neighbor is not a command, not a wish. Remember, it's a command. In the final analysis, each of us must respond to the question, do you really, really, really know God? We say we really know God and what he has called us to do. If that is true, now what? If you really, really, really know God, now what? If you really, 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 really know God, now what? If um, Dorothy Rowe was speaking on one corner and Al Rowe was speaking on the other corner, I think I do it here, her. <laughs> and um, I now know why the commissioners came here today. And um, I, I want to thank um, Dorothy Rowe for sharing and expanding uh, what happened last week. And we want to thank um, Freehold Director Evans for appropriately and effectively introducing um, Women's Month to us. And we thank also Chris Ivey, who served um, as the chairman today of the Black History Women's Day Committee. Give all of the hands. Ain't we blessed? We got some great, beautiful women in this church. And we love them all. Let us stand. You're right, God. You're right. I have to call a period. 
Spirit of the Matriarch. You know, it's here in, 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 in March. Um, and um, and um, thank you very much. God bless you. Let us stand and sing together. I meditate on Him. God will take care of you. And after we sing the third stanza, I ask that as the organist plays softly, that we would pray that God would take care of us. Pray for yourself. Whatever is on your heart. And in his opening statement, he said, 
December the 8th, 1941, will go down in history as a day of infamy. And as he sought to comfort and calm a terrified American nation, he ended his speech with the immortal words, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. President Roosevelt recognized that fear was a greater enemy to the American nation than Japan. Fear is a paralyzing, devastating enemy. Fear is the biggest and most destructive enemy one can meet. And if it is not confronted and defeated, it will destroy us. Fear has the power to stop every one of us in our tracks, prevent us from fulfilling our dream or achieving our goal. The fear of cancer, AIDS, diabetes, or high blood pressure will keep us from going to the doctor. The fear of failure has so paralyzed some people that they won't even try a new idea, or travel a new path, or even go back to school. The fear of being alone has somebody stuck in a relationship that is dead, destructive, and depressing. The fear of commitment has some people so paralyzed that they will never enter an intimate, self-giving relationship or get married. A couple years ago, I read an article in the U.S. News and World Report, which talked about all the fears there are. And it had all those names that I can't even pronounce. And last week, I looked on the internet trying to find that article for it to refresh my memory. But when I put in fear, phobia came up. And it lists all of the fears and phobias that people have from A to Z. And I was shocked. I knew about the fear of heights and the fear of flying in the airplane. I knew about the fear of worms and frogs. But then listed there were the fear of darkness, the fear of crowds, the fear of marriage, the fear of sex. Fear of hell, the fear of fire, the fear of thunder, the fear of the church, the fear of God, the fear of ideas, the fear of darkness, the fear of wealth, the fear of music, the fear of crossing the street. And I said, my God. Just about everything there is in the world. Someone has a fear about it. And anyone who will fulfill a dream, make a contribution, live an abundant, fulfilling life with a sense of focus and purpose must face their fears head on. No matter what the event, the adversary, or the problem. <laughs> you can't. Find joy in life, unless you're willing to face your fears. We do not know the circumstances under which David wrote this 27th Psalm. Some scholars claim that it came out of his sore situation. When David was forced to run for his life, you remember, David was a popular leader. When he came back from the war, the women and children stood in the street shouting, Saul has slain his thousands, and David has slain 10,000. And because of jealousy, Saul wanted to eliminate David. And I want to say to you this morning, 
because you are favored by God, just because you are anointed by God, doesn't mean that you won't have enemies. Just like David, who was anointed by God. You can have those who want to destroy you, not because of anything that you have done, but only because God has favored you. And then there are others who say that David wrote this out of his Absalom situation. <coughs> Absalom, his own son, hired thugs to assassinate his own father. And this tells us that those who are closest to you, folks in your own family, folks who say that they're your friends, folks who ought to support you, there'll be times when they will try to destroy you because of jealousy. Just because you are anointed and favored by God, your best relationships can become Unglued, your kids can act the fool, your heart can get broken, your money can be funny. The bottom can drop out of your life, despite the fact that God has favored you. And some say that, that David wrote this out of the Philistine situation. The Philistines were always there. They were always his enemy, no matter what. David would... Pray to God and turn them over to God, then he'll take it back. There'll always be a struggle. There'll always be a wrestling with the Philistines. It seemed like the Philistines were always there. And there are some nagging problems that are always with you. I don't care what the situation is. You can learn to Say the psalm and make it yours, only if you have the faith and the courage of David. We don't know when David wrote this psalm, but whenever he wrote it, he was in real trouble. His job was in jeopardy, his home was in shambles, his life was threatened, and his enemies were all around him. And yet he could say, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now you can't appreciate these words unless you've been in the dark. You can't appreciate these words unless you've had a difficult time and you felt that you were all by yourself. If your life has always been rosy, if everything has always gone well with you, if you have one victory after another, you can't understand nor appreciate these words. But if the bottom has dropped out of your life, and it seems as though you are all alone, and you have wept some bitter tears, then you can appreciate these words of David. The language of this text is from the courtroom. Because David uses legal language of adversaries, witnesses, prosecutors, and trials. <coughs> David testifies that there are several legal provisions that God offers to everybody who would trust in him and walk with him. God has empowered each of us to face, fight, and manage our life despite the fears we have. Amen. Somebody here this morning need to hear this lesson because there is something going on in your life right now. You're nervous about tomorrow. You wonder if you're going to be able to make it. There's some problem that you're facing. And you need to know what God has to say to you on this first Sunday in March. And I tell you, the first thing we need to know is God has a witness protection plan for his people. 
Let me break that down for you. Every now and then the government discovers somebody who knows something about something or somebody, and depending upon the sensitivity, the worth, and the value of what they know about the case, the person that is exposed to as a result of the information that they may have, the government makes a deal with them. And basically, it goes something like this. If you're willing to testify about what you've seen and heard and know, then we are willing to relocate you to another place, change your name, give you a new identity, and establish a whole new life for you. David says in the sixth verse, I will say praises to God, is because he has discovered in the time of trouble God will hide him from his adversaries. God will hide him from his enemies. God will relocate him to another place and hide him in the secret of his tabernacle. If David was here today, he would say, I recognize I've got some problems. I've got some enemies all around me. I've got some problems in my house. I, I've got disease in my body, but I also got praise on my lip because God will relocate me. God will provide protection for me if I'm his witness. My praise for his protection and his provision. So I got to tell you what I know about God. I got to tell you where God has brought me from. I got to tell you what God has told me. Some of you may not like it, but I've got to witness for the Lord. I've got to tell what I've seen in you. I've got to tell what he's done for me. I'm in God's witness protection program, and nobody can do me no harm. They may talk about me. They may stare me in the back. They may plot to ruin me, but they can't destroy me because I'm in God's witness protection program. Folks may work on my failure and my downfall, but I'm a witness for the Lord. Yes. I've got to tell what I've seen, heard, and know about Jesus. Amen. And I tell you this morning, I'm going to tell it yes. no matter what anybody says. Yes. I know he was born in Bethlehem and Herod tried to destroy him at his birth. I know that he, he was sick and raised the dead. I know he spoke to the winds and to the waves and quiet them. I know he healed a man named Barnabas. I know he told the kids to come down from a tree and turn his life all around. I know he raised a man by the name of Lazarus from the grave. I know he took him up a hill and they nailed him to a cross and he died and they put him in a buried tomb. But early Sunday morning, he got up. I'm a witness. And because I'm a witness, I'm in God's witness protection program. Nobody can do me no harm. You see, that's why you can come to church and be quiet if you want to. But I gotta testify. I have to praise God, not just because of what he's already done for me, but because of what he's doing for me now and what he's going to do for me tomorrow. I know somebody here has to go to work tomorrow and face some crazy co-workers or the rain supervisor. I know somebody must have a doctor's appointment. And I know somebody has to go to a lawyer in a courtroom and the lawyer doesn't care anything about you. So you ought to praise the Lord today and make sure that the Lord goes with you no matter what happens. I, I 
I'm in God's witness protection program. And nobody can do me no harm. And then David says, the Lord will hide me and lift my head above my enemies who are all around me. My question is, God, how are you going to hide me in a place where my enemies can clearly see me? And God's response to me was, I'm not going to take you out of what you're in, but I'm going to position you in it in such a way that although your enemies can see you, they won't be able to slay you. They can see where you are, but can't get where you're at. Let me show you what I mean. And back in the hood in Syracuse, and we used to play a complicated, complicated game called hide and seek. I, I, I better explain it to you because it's a difficult game. And, and what would happen is we would put our foot in and say, any meeting, mighty mo, catch a tiger by the toe. If he holler, let it go. And then the last one out would be it. And it would have to go to a tree and start counting. And then we would run in all directions and hide. And then it would come after us. And if it touched us, we became it. If we're behind the edges and it got too close to us, we would get nervous. If we ran in the house and it just opened the door and came in, we would get scared. The one thing we didn't want to happen was for it to get us. But there's another part about the story, and this is the most important part of all. If you could get to home base, it could see, <laughs> but it couldn't get you out. And I want to tell you this morning, my Christian friend, I, I, I see life with my adversaries and get all around me. But if I get the whole base, it can't do nothing to me because I'm safe. I'm safe. I'm safe. And so I say, disease can see me, but they can't destroy me. Sickness can touch me, but it can't help me. Because I'm safe. Enemies can see me, but they can't hurt me because I'm safe. And David said, he wants to let you know that if you are in God's witness program, if you get into the cabinet, you get into the house of the Lord, you are safe. You know, doing a war, doing riots. If you get into the house of the Lord, they can't even come in and get you. And don't you know a murderer, a murderer, a crook can come into the house of the Lord, and the law can't come and get him because he has sanctuary. And if the murderer and the robber has sanctuary in the house of the Lord, what do you think God does for his witnesses? And so I want to get home. I, I want to be home where I'm safe. And David says, God wants to give you enrollment in the witness protection program. Secondly, God offers legal guardianship. There are times now when, when a child is not raised by its biological parent and the court allows somebody else to be the legal guardian of the child. And this legal guardian has to protect and care for the child just as though it was their own. That's what we do in the 
in our home ministering program here. That's what we do. We find foster parents for kids because their parents can't take care of them. So in our family resource ministry, we find guardians for the children who have to take care of them as though they're their own. And David says to us in verse 10, when my mother and my father forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. The point being that God is our guardian. God is our guardian. That, that means that God has control over our success, our destiny, our activity in our lives. That even when I want to leave God, he's faithful. And he won't leave me. God says, I know you want to leave me sometime, but I refuse to let you go. God is my guardian. God looks after me even when I'm not thinking about God. Don't you know in this life you can make mistakes that can cause your mother and your father to walk away from you? Don't you know you can do stuff that even your best friend will walk away from you and kick you out? But I want to say to you that when others reject you and kick you out, God keeps you. When God, when others declare that you're unworthy, God says we are worthy. When others turn their back on you, God opens his arms to you. I'm, gl I'm glad God will be our guardians when nobody else wants us around. Even when you have done the worst and the lowest of the low and everybody is ashamed and embarrassed by you, even when your mother don't want to speak your name with affection and your father is not proud of who you are, then God will pick you up. God will stretch out his hand and say, come to me, my child. Isn't it good news to know that no matter how low we fall, no matter how bad we are, there's a God who will cradle us in his arms and rock us to sleep at night and tell us that I love you. I want to let you know that God loves you and he loves me. We want to ask sometimes how it is that God can receive us when our mother don't want to us, don't want us. How can God bless us when our daddy don't want to own us? And I'm glad you asked that question. Because the answer is right here in verse 7. And David says, the Lord has mercy on us. That's how. God has mercy on us. And if you ever do a crime, and I hope you don't, and you are convicted by the judge and the jury, and there's no reasonable doubt that you're guilty, and if you have a good lawyer, the attorney will say to you, now, this is no time to be hard and arrogant and tough. You know you're guilty. And what you have to do now is throw yourself on the mercy of the court. Don't, 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 don't try to play hardball if you know that you're guilty. You just throw yourself on the mercy of the court. And when time comes for you to make your statement, you get up and say, Your Honor, I did the crime. And I deserve the time. But what I want to do is to throw myself on the mercy of the court. 
and gave it to me to tell you that when your life is messed up, <coughs> you've made foolish decisions and foolish mistakes. And when you've taken foolish chances, that's not the time to go boldly into the presence of the God, presence of God, and act like you deserve to be blessed. Don't you get down on your knees and say, Lord, here I am, your child. I want you to bless me. I don't want you to lie and tell God what you have done, and what you want to do, and what you will do. If you know that you are guilty, you better get down on your knees and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve your blessing. I want you to help me. I want you to have mercy on me. And the good news is that when we go into God's presence like that, God has mercy on us because he is a merciful God. He will look beyond our faults and he will see our every need. I want to ask you, Cal, is there any body here who is not ashamed to say the only reason I'm living today is because of the mercy and grace of God. Yeah. You ought to be able to say the only reason I'm here in the land yeah. of the living yeah. is because of the mercy of God. Yeah. I don't know if you look around and see who's gone and who's back. But I tell you, a few weeks ago, I went back home to Syracuse when they started telling me that this one was gone and this one was gone and that 